WIMT Mountain News at 6. Partners for Rural Impact was recently awarded two new grants for Letcher County and Jenkins Independent Schools. And today, community and school leaders gathered together to discuss their plans to elevate the outcomes of every student in the county. I was there during the event and learned more about the grants and the community leaders' goals. Every child, every day. And it takes a community coming together to ensure no child is left behind. That is what Partners for Role Impact Associate Vice President Eamon Couch says is necessary. There's already amazing work happening in every community, but how often do they actually come together and have a conversation? And so today was very, today's agenda was very driven and very purposeful, purposeful around saying, what is your contribution? On Tuesday, PRI staff hosted an event at Kane Kitchen in Letcher County, bringing the community together discussing how they plan to utilize two new grants in their school systems. Partners for Rural Impact was awarded two major United States Department of Education grants, Promise Neighborhood and Full Service Community Schools. And so we already had, we already had our gear up programs here, but three major initiatives that we are, in essence, launching together. Both new grants will provide $9 million a year for the next five years. Letcher County Public Schools Superintendent Denise Yantz said she is thrilled to see the community pulling together to ensure the money is used in a sustainable That at the end of the money in five years that the programs and the things that we have uh, created here in Letcher County can continue even without that financial support that we um, put systems in place that are sustainable so that students for years to come can benefit from it. And Jenkins Independent Superintendent Damian Johnson says their primary job in education is to open doors and create opportunities for students. And that's exactly what these grants do. They give us opportunity to, um, to provide our students with resources that we, we otherwise would not have and to take them places and show them things that we otherwise would not be able to show them. Associate VP with PRI, Eamon Couch, says the conversations they had this morning are going to continue to evolve, and they plan to continue hosting events with the Letcher County community to ensure the grants are utilized in the best ways possible. Casey Bird, the man accused of killing London police officer Logan Medlock in an October 2022 crash, is asking for a change of venue for his trial. Bird is charged with murder and drunk driving. The Lexington Herald leader reports an attorney for Bird says he cannot get a fair trial and impartial trial because of Medlock's status in the community. The petition also cites, quote, overwhelming publicity in the case. Bird is scheduled to appear in court for a pretrial conference later this week. A crash involving a fire truck left one East Tennessee firefighter dead. North Tazewell Volunteer Fire Department Captain 27-year-old Roy Sewell Jr. was driving the truck when it ran off the road, traveled down an embankment, rolled over, and landed on its top. The crash happened on State Highway 63 near Cedar Fork Road in Claiborne County. Sewell was responding to an ATV crash involving a child when it happened. We've been following a fire at Natural Bridge State Park for the last week, and investigators say they now suspect arson as the cause, though the official cause is still under investigation. Crews worked tirelessly to fight the fire, and as of today, the flames are out. But the Kentucky Division of Forestry says it burned more than 100 acres. Mariah Congito has the latest. It's very quiet here at the Skylift today because all of the crews are now gone. The Kentucky Division of Forestry tells me as of this morning, the fire is controlled. They say this means the fire is completely out and the work they needed to do is done. Now this fire is a very complicated fire just because of the terrain. Steve Call with the Kentucky Division of Forestry says usually they can put out a wildfire in a day or so. However, he says this wasn't the case this time due to the nature of the park's cliff lines and formations. We had to find areas where our crews could come off the top of the mountain and maybe a break in the cliff line where they could establish their control lines and be able to hold the fire. This is what it looked like from the sky lift just last week. Call says originally they expected 240 acres to burn though crews were able to contain it to 125 acres. Call says no property was damaged, including the Skylift building at the top where the fire was raging. But it's the dedication of about 100 firefighters out there working 
12, 14, 16 hour shifts, making sure everything was controlled. Call says it's still unclear how the fire was started, but that they do suspect arson. Now that it's safe, it's out and so on, our investigators will look closer at where it started and, and how it might have gotten started. Call says this wildfire is one of roughly 600 that have occurred across the state this spring. He says they account for the nearly 14,000 acres that have burned. I'm told it's now up to the park to determine when the trails will reopen and what repairs, if any, need to be done before visitors can come back. At Natural Bridge State Park, Mariah Kajito, WKYT. Our sister station, WKYT, has reached out to for park officials to see what their timeline is for reopening, but they have not heard back. Well, plenty of us saw clouds out there today, but a lot of a lot of folks are already seeing some sunshine as the sun gets closer to setting. We're at 63 in Buffalo Mountain right now, 64 from London Corbin Airport. Plenty of sunshine there as well. We will continue to see the milder air. It's not necessarily mild, but it's milder than we saw yesterday in the low to even middle 60s at this hour. But we've got some cooler air on the way. Your forecast first going zone by zone. Some folks falling below those middle 40s tonight, especially in those sheltered valley locations. That's why that frost advisory is in place for many locations. Look at places like Hindman Pikeville falling into the 30s tonight. Even Inez not far from freezing. Guys, I'll have the very latest in a few minutes on when the showers move in and when to expect the greatest threat in a few minutes. All right, Evan, thank you. One Eastern Kentucky community is continuing to mourn the loss of a former longtime Eastern Kentucky state representative. WYMT's RJ Johnson talked to a friend and colleague about Hubert Collins' impact both in and out of office. For more than two decades, Hubert Hubie Collins served as the 97th district representative. Originally from the Wittensville community of Johnson County, Collins loved the community and Commonwealth of Kentucky. Well, he was just very passionate about what he did. I said he lived and breathed being a state representative. He was everywhere. He was at every function, everything going on. You could always count on Hubie to be in any kind of public function. He was there. Even though he was not in office anymore, Bobby McCool says he was still there whenever he needed any guidance. But he was still there as a resource. If anybody wanted anything, if you need any, he was uh, always there. One thing about Hubie, you could always call him anytime. He would always get back to you. And he always made his, his number public, so he's very open. McCool says Collins put everything he could into his job, leaving behind a strong legacy. What you want to know about Hubie, he was just a really good man. Good man. And it's a sad day in Johnson County and in, in, in the entire state because losing such a good man and and he brought such, you know, such enthusiasm and heart to the job he did. So we'll miss him. We certainly will miss him. With love pouring in from the community, McCool says Collins will never be forgotten. In Johnson County, R.J. Johnson, WIMT Mountain News. Hubie's visitation continues until 8 o'clock tonight and will continue again at 9 a.m. tomorrow. The funeral is scheduled to start at 1 p.m. tomorrow at the Jones Preston Funeral Home in Paintsville. More news after this. WIMT News app offers alerts on breaking stories as they happen. Customized.